want to start by asking you a question this morning. What is an Anabaptist Christian? Did you know if we just look at the Mennonites, which are one group within the broader Anabaptist family, there are 1.6 million Mennonites worldwide today, and 60% of them live in Africa, Asia, or Latin America. It's interesting to think now that even though the movement started in Europe and came to North America, now the majority of Mennonites are in the global south. So as we think about ourselves as Mennonites, we, we might ask the question, the bigger question, what is an Anabaptist Christian? What is an Anabaptist Christian? And today we're going to be looking at one part of this question. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the role of Jesus for Anabaptist Christians. But before we launch into our scriptures today and that particular theme, I want us to think just broadly together, what is an Anabaptist Christian? As many of you know, the Anabaptists draw their heritage from the Protestant Reformation. In 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses onto the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, and it launched a whole movement of churches questioning the way that theology had been done and how church life had been understood, holding up a new emphasis on the importance of Scripture as the authority for our faith. And one of the leaders of that early movement, Ulrich Swingli, who was in Zurich, Switzerland, began exploring s scriptures in, particular, in a particular way, a little bit different than Martin Luther, and around him formed a group that eventually would become known as Anabaptists. They wanted to have a radically different understanding of church life, not one just only grounded in traditions of the past, but one that went back to the root Sometimes they were called radicals, and they, met, they liked the term radical, not in the sense that they were unruly, but radical meaning going back to the root, back to the scriptures, to the source of the faith, to the life of Jesus. And so eventually, um, the early Anabaptists had concerns with Swingley's interpretation and what he was doing, and they separated off and became their own movement. And we're going to walk through that some later today as we get deeper into our message. But suffice it to say, Anabaptist Christians today are a diverse group of people around the world interested in going back to the core of the faith, following Christ, focused on the life of Jesus and what that means in the 21st century. And so let's spend a little time now exploring this idea of Jesus at the center of our faith and the importance of Christ. And I'd like for us to do that by looking at just once again the scriptures that were read for you and walking through some of the things that are mentioned about Christ in these passages. Now, these are some scriptures that give us some big ideas, and you could almost think of them as laying out for us some of the core, bless you, some of the core tenets of our faith. What are, what are we told here in our passage today? I put it almost like a list of bullet points here, but we really get an outline of Jesus' role. The Son is the image of the invisible God image this representation that we can see that gives us insight into who God is. And what is that referring to in our faith? The incarnation, right? The Son, through Him, all things have been created and for Him. He was there at creation. He's intimately involved with all the things that came into being in our world. He was there at creation. He is the head of the body, the church, so He cares about the church. He has an ongoing interest in being with us in our work and our mission in the world. In fact, he's so intimately connected to us, he is like a head would be to a body. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Once again, another reference to the incarnation. Through him, all things are reconciled to God by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Salvation. He's able to achieve for us this gift of salvation. And, and I didn't mention it in this list, but it also talks about in our passage today, he's the firstborn from the dead, this idea of the resurrection. All these core themes are held together and presented to us here in Colossians. It's a beautiful reflection on who Jesus is. And when we read it, we think, of course, of course the early Anabaptists wanted to go back to Christ and focus on him as the core of our theology. He is the center of what we believe and what we seek to 
emulate. And the scriptures lay out for us why. Let's see what Hebrews tells us. God has spoken to us by his son. Revelation. Jesus reveals to us the heart of God. God appointed him heir of all things. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. Once again, the incarnation, God among us, dwelling among us. He sustains all things by His powerful word, this image of creation. Jesus is there sustaining all things from the beginning and through this time where we are now. He provided purification for sin, the gift of salvation, and He is seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, this vision of the kingdom of heaven that we are invited to enjoy with him in eternity. Jesus is the center of our faith. And as we walk through this today, not only from these scriptures, but as we think about history a little bit together and what this means to Anabaptists, we'll see why this is so important. Jesus is the center of our faith. We might think uh, a little bit about Jesus. What type of life did he live? Why is he so inspiring to Anabaptist Christians that they would say he is the center of our faith? Well, he gathered a small group of disciples and for three years he lived with them and ate with them and worked with them. He cared for the poor. He healed those who were ill. He gave sight to the blind. He forgave sinners. He taught the multitudes. When we look to Jesus and the life he lived, we are inspired by his compassion, by his insight, by his concern for others by his care and by his gift of himself on the cross. When we look to him, we find all we need in the way of inspiration to live a full life in the sight of God. And the grace he gives us enables us to do that. But this question of what is an Anabaptist Christian brings to mind some times in church history when we have gotten our focus off Christ, or at least the way we have understood him has been obscured a bit by things that have happened or the way we think. And so I'd like to walk through some of those distortions or unhelpful aspects of church history with you real quickly. And all of this information has been inspired by and can be found in an article by Palmer Becker. I'm going to put back the first slide real quick here so you can see Palmer Becker. Um, this article he wrote, What is an Anabaptist Christian? You can find that online if you just Google it. It's in the Mennonite publication, Missio Day. It's a very interesting article. Um, I don't agree with everything 100% he says, but I think it's a very helpful article. And so I just put that up there if you ever want to follow up with this after the message. Oops. I think I've gotten us out of the, the um, slide aspect that I was working with. Um, so just we'll wait a second here. Thank you very much. Okay. So I just want to mention, uh, start here with this character here on the upper, I guess it would be your left part of the screen um, if you're looking at the notes, you already know who that is, but does anybody recognize this, um, this face, or have you ever seen that before? It's, it's of Constantine. He's the first Christian Roman emperor. First Christian Roman emperor. Okay. And Constantine introduced something that Palmer Becker, he introduced something to Christianity that Palmer Becker, the author of this article I'm talking with you about today, was very concerned about, and I'm going to tell you what that is right now. On October 27th, in the year 312, Constantine had this vision while he was with his troops and he was looking up at the sun. This is recorded for us by the church historian Eusebius of Caesarea. He was looking up to the sun and he saw a cross, something in the shape of the cross, in light, and he received this message now listen to this. This is going to be shocking to us, okay? In this sign, you will conquer. Okay. He sees the cross. He's a warrior now. He's, this is before he's become a Christian. And he sees the sign of the cross and he hears the words, In this sign, you will conquer. So what does he do? He makes um, a, a large banner to be carried with his troops into battle. And at the top of this banner, they called it a laborium. There were the signs. It looked like an, a cross, like, and it had a, an R almost coming down, and then it had another X at the bottom. And if we were to, I could 
draw it much better than describe it with words. But basically, it was the two first letters of the word Christ uh, in Greek. It's the CH and then the R, and they were put together on this sign that they carried in the war. And they went to war, and they won this battle in 312, the Battle of the Milverian Bridge. And Constantine ascribed it to this vision. And the next year, the year 313, uh, he produced what's called the Edict of Milan, which was permitted Christianity in the Roman Empire. And soon thereafter, Christianity became the supported state religion. And we might see where this is going, okay? As Anabaptists, we intrinsically already can see where this is going. So then once it was an official religion in the Roman Empire, it had state support, which was a mixed thing, right? Because not only did it have state support, but it also had state involvement <laughs> and things that were going on in the church. So there was a shift from small house church groups to large buildings where people would gather. Um, clergy went from wearing the clothes of ordinary people to wearing clothes that resembled some of the other state officials. Even the organization of churches into metropolitans and dioceses resembled the organization that the Roman Empire had at the time for their regions. And even more so, as you became a Christian, it was connected with your citizenship. As you became a Christian through baptism, it was part of your identity as a Roman citizen. So we can see why Palmer Becker would say the Anabaptists have a huge problem with Constantine. Uh, because what he did is, not only did he re-envision the image of the cross to something that could be used in a militaristic way, but he also then brought a whole bunch of changes in the church that changed the nature of the relationships and the communities and brought a whole new attention to leaders in the church in a way that perhaps got the focus off of the simplicity of the one who is the center of our faith, our Lord Jesus Christ, the life of simplicity that he modeled. And so Palmer Becker says, we need to be aware that that happened and we need to be aware that sometimes elements of that still affect us today in our churches um, and still some of the thinking and the mindset from that era is still active today in ways that we're not always aware of. Now, there's a second figure that he brings up in his article, and I don't know, you probably can't recognize him from this statue, but if you're following him, you'll, you'll know. This is Augustine. Augustine, a theologian writing around the time of Constantine, maybe a little, little later. Um, he was probably about 20 years younger than Constantine, but still overlapped with his, Constantine's life. Now, Augustine was a tremendously influential theologian, as we all know his name. Um, he had a huge impact on Western Christianity. But Palmer Becker says there's something about Augustine that was unhelpful, that was probably an unintended consequence of his writings. He had a unique emphasis in his teaching on original sin. Now, I know we can draw the seeds of that teaching into Scripture and see evidences for it, but the way that Augustine taught original sin was kind of unique in that he said all human beings were born with this stain of original sin, this original guilt. And for Augustine, at baptism, which he understood primarily to be for children as it was increasingly becoming practice, but, you know, for adult converts as well, but... At that moment, that stain of original sin was washed off of the person in his theology. So he had this emphasis on the sacrament, baptism as a sacrament, and grace somehow coming through that practice in that way that that stain of original sin is washed off. And somehow the focus of his theology in, in trying to deal with this problem of original sin seemed to zero in on the death of Christ. And I know we all look to the cross and the death of Christ as the source of the grace that we have in salvation. But there was this shift away from the life that Jesus lived and more a direct zooming in on Jesus as a means of grace. And then understanding that primarily is coming through sacraments, these outward signs that we celebrate of communion or baptism or anointing with oil or marriage or ordination or whatever ones we would list. And Palmer Becker says that was unhelpful for the church because it got the focus off of the life that Jesus lived, and it got us focused on, in some cases, misunderstanding part of the message and focusing on ritual, shifting away from his life and getting focused on another aspect that would take us away from that core of who Jesus was. 
So if you combine Augustine's theology to deal with original sin with Constantine's church-state model, then the practice of infant baptism becomes even more unhelpful from an Anabaptist point of view. So you can see by the time of the Reformation why they really want to address this problem. Which brings us to our third figure, Martin Luther, who we all know, as I started with in the beginning for launching the Protestant Reformation. And Luther's emphasis on Scripture as a sole authority for faith was something the Anabaptists loved. I said earlier, they were radicals in the sense they wanted to go back to the core. They wanted to go back to the basic um, starting point, um, the basic foundation of their faith. So they, they really appreciated, Anabaptists really appreciated Martin Luther's emphasis on rediscovering the supremacy of Scripture and his emphasis really on Christ and salvation through Christ, salvation through faith in Christ. But the, the Anabaptists were concerned because Luther didn't seem to say anything or seem to change enough this dynamic that had existed from the time of Constantine of that church-state relationship. What happened was in the Protestant Reformation, basically, different portions of Europe became associated with different types of Christian churches. So you had a section of Germany that fell under the Lutheran influence, and so those churches kind of maintained that model from the Constantinian era. People who were baptized were baptized into the Lutheran church, and they were members of that particular part of Germany, and that church-state connection was still there. If you were in Geneva and you were baptized, you would have been connected with Calvin and the Reform Movement in Geneva. If you were in Zurich, you would have been connected with Ulrich Swingley and the Reform Movement there. And the Anabaptist said, there's something wrong with this picture. We need to go back to the original view that was held in the New Testament that when you accepted Christ, when you became a Christian, when you, when you were born again, you had that conversion of heart, it was a conscious decision. A person, it was, it was believer's baptism. A person chose to enter into that. It wasn't just by nature of where they were born, that they happened to be in this geographical location. And by default, since they're baptized there, they're connected with citizenship and everything in that region. They said, no, it has to be a decision, and there has to be freedom in that decision. We can't force people or coerce them into having this particular view. And that brings us to our fourth figure, Menno Simons, who was a former Catholic priest. And as we all know, Menno Simons is where we get the name Mennonite from. And he was a, became a very influential leader in the Anabaptist movement in, by 1536. And he traveled all around Germany and the Netherlands for 25 years sharing the Anabaptist message, which was basically, as we said earlier, that Jesus invites us into this life of discipleship. It involves the grace he gives us through the cross, but it's a lifelong process of discipleship, following Jesus. And the best way we can do that is to seek a transformed life by reading the Gospels, by reading the Scriptures and focusing on, on Jesus. Think of the Sermon on the Mount and what he teaches there. Think of the ways that he models a different way of living. And somehow the Anabaptists expected a transformation like that, not just mental assent to a certain doctrine, but a transformed way of life. And that is the message that Menno Simons went around sharing. And not only that, but also the important value of community as we read Scripture together and, and do life together, the important role of nonviolence, not participating in um, military endeavors or coercion in any way. And so, basically, Palmer Becker leaves us with these four figures and says, as we think about Jesus, we need to be aware of what each of them brought to the table, and we need to refocus our vision in on Christ today, where we are today, and identify times when we're drawn away from him by other teachings. I'd like to... Um, show you the next three points, and then we're going to walk through them um, as we close. So these are the three main convictions of this, of this article as we think of Jesus. Jesus is to be followed in daily life. It's not just that we make a decision one time in our life, and it's a mental ascent to doctrine, and that's it. It's a life journey with Jesus every day. The Bible is interpreted from a Christ-centered point of view, so somehow Christ has to be involved even in how we read the Old Testament and other portions of the New Testament and the Gospels. Every part is centered through Jesus' life. And Jesus is accepted as both Savior and Lord. And that's that point about discipleship. 
We accept him in the gift of salvation, but then when he has lordship over our lives, it means a daily walk with him. So I want to share this quote from Palmer Becker. If you would, um, just look at it here with me. And um, would you read this with me? Starting up top here. Salvation in the Anabaptist tradition means being transformed from an old way of life to a life that exemplifies the spirit and actions of Jesus. The teachings and spirit of Jesus make it possible for committed followers to be transformed and to overcome the powers of evil. Anabaptists are encouraged to a radical following of Jesus in daily life. Thank you, that's excellent. And Palmer Becker goes on to say, Christianity is discipleship. So he really wants to hold up this value here of following Jesus in daily life. Following Jesus in daily life. And he's saying that's the hallmark of Anabaptist spirituality right there. I want to show you the next quote, which is for the next principle. The Bible is interpreted in a Christ-centered way. It's interpreted Christocentrically. Once again, will you read this quote with me? Christians, from an Anabaptist perspective, seek to interpret all Scripture from an ethical, Christ-centered point of view. Jesus is seen as the fullest revelation of God and God's will. Thus, when Anabaptist-minded Christians face an ethical question, they go first to Jesus for their primary guidance and then to other Scriptures for further background and understanding. Okay. Thank you. And finally, the last principle that Palmer Becker says for a Christ-centered approach that Anabaptists share um, has to do with the relationship, once again, that the church and the state and how Christians navigate their loyalty to Christ. So this is the last quote, if you would read with me, please. Many Christians look to Jesus as Savior from personal bad habits, but when they face larger social or political problems, they give their obedience to an employer, civic leader, military general, or president. Christians from an Anabaptist perspective believe that government needs to be obeyed to the extent that Christian discipleship will allow. Our highest loyalty always belongs to Jesus and the kingdom of God. Now that last belief, if we are thinking about history, we know that's where Anabaptists got into trouble in particular, because they wouldn't just embrace what the state said to do in Germany or in Switzerland or Geneva. Um, they wouldn't just go along and, and bury their own convictions. They said, no, we want to live differently. In fact, this is so important to us that some of us are going to be rebaptized and we're going to start waiting until our children are old enough to decide and when they're young adults or, or teenagers, they can be baptized. And they, they want a different way, even though the state at the time was saying that that was illegal and they were persecuted for it until they eventually came here to, the, to settle in Pennsylvania and, and other places in North America and parts of Europe where they weren't persecuted anymore. So we know this cost them dearly, but they believe it was so important. And maybe for us, even more pressing examples would be once Anabaptists and Mennonites came here to this country, we can think even of World War I, those who wouldn't serve in the military because of their conscience. Many of them put into prison because in that time, there wasn't a conscientious objector program. Finally, by the time World War II came, there was, so there were other ways for Anabaptists and Mennonites to serve, but we know that this belief was so important to them that they were willing to sacrifice. And it's interesting, as many of, the, as many of you know, through um, the voluntary service and uh, programs that happened in World War II and afterward, that many of these Mennonites and Anabaptists were used powerfully in the mental health fields and other fields that since they were given an opportunity to serve, God used them powerfully where they were and honored their conviction and what they chose to do to honor their conscience and their calling there. So I want to leave us with three questions, and this is the final thing uh, for us today. You can pick one if you want to focus on um, whichever one of these you think is most pressing to your life right now. But they relate to the core beliefs, the core principles of our message today. Question one, do I fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith? Have we, each one of us, been in, intentional about spending time with him daily 
and thinking of our lives as a journey with him and holding up that calling that he has for each one of us daily to follow him. Number two, do I interpret the scriptures from a Christ-centered point of view? When we read the Bible, are we aware that Christ is the fullness of God's revelation and that all that we read, as we're trying to make sense of it and find a way to live it out, all of it finds its fulfillment in him. Do we believe that? Do we read scripture that way? And finally, question three, do I see Christianity as discipleship and seek to follow Jesus in daily life? Christianity is discipleship. And each of us, I know I speak for myself, um, I need to continually rediscover this, that daily life is the, oftentimes some of the most powerful times or ways that God interacts with me and uses me is in the simple things of daily life if I'm open, if I'm open to receive him and follow him in those daily, ordinary circumstances. So I invite you this week, take one of these and try to go deeper with it, explore it. If you have time, look this article up and, and reflect on it, or just think about the notes that we've shared today and the passages that we shared, and let's all together affirm in our faith that Christ is the center, and let's live as Christ is the center.